Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Asad Laji. On behalf of Avid Learning, welcome. Once I thought I was a rose blooming in a hidden place. Once I thought I was a star reviewing its own set of laws. Once I thought I was the mind driven by the engine of dreams. Once I thought I was the sun. Once I thought I was myself. Before you start applauding me on my, my flair for poetry and diction, let me tell you the above lines are from Electronic Flower, a poem generated by Code Da Vinci, the cousin of ChatGPT, featuring a collection of poems called I Am Code and Artificial Intelligence Speaks, an anthology of poems written by AI. As digital technology becomes more immersive in the world of literature, it opens up a plethora of opportunities for authors, storytellers, readers, sometimes blurring the lines between fiction and reality. Literature is one of the most important and robust verticals and our, in our curatorial vision at Avid Learning. We regularly collaborate with literature festivals, publishing houses, authors, intellectuals, and thought leaders, presenting diversely rich experiences. Earlier this month, I curated and moderated a spectacular session uh, with the country's leading literary festival founders and directors, From Pages to Stages, the story of the Indian Literature Festivals at the Festival of Libraries, organized by the Ministry of Culture, Government of India in New Delhi. Tonight, we are delighted to present Literary Algorithms, the Evolution of Literature in a Digital Age. It's the second chapter in our Tech Forward programming series, which will decode and unravel the digital literacy landscape where text meets tech. In our early editions, we looked at artificial intelligence and the future of tech art. At Avid Learning, we strongly believe in collaboration and are proud to present this evening in partnership with the National Gallery of Modern Art, the NGMA Mumbai, and the Ministry of Culture, Government of India. And a special thank you to the director of NGMA Mumbai, Nazneen Banu, and Deputy Director uh, Shruti Das for hosting us. Now it gives me great pleasure to welcome on stage our panel of experts. Please join your hands in welcoming founder and director of the Big, Sne Big Sneeze content company, Gayatri Pahelojani. <laughs> Author, screenwriter, and journalist, Meghna Panth. <laughs> Senior insurance executive and author, uh, Tanud Sulanki. <laughs> founder and CEO, KidStopPress.com, Mansi Zaveri. And our moderator for the evening, journalist, book columnist, and founder, Juhu Book Club, Sonia Datta Chaudhry. Thank you all for being here in such big numbers. I look forward to a, a fascinating session, and over to you, Sonia. Thank you. Good evening, and welcome to the session of Decoding the Literary Algorithm. It's the age of the algorithm, and at a time where you have Bookstagram and Book Talk, and you can read book lists from Barack Obama and Bill Gates. And you can also listen to poetry from Chat GPT and its cousins. Um, what, <laughs> what are the possibilities and what are the perils of this new format? And how can we, as readers and writers and creators, um, use this? and also guard against, protect ourselves from the perils of it, uh, of this, this new form. And so to decode this, we have like a star panel here. Um, and the, the great thing about the award-winning and popular writers here is that they're all awesomely agile between formats and mediums, and that's something that's gonna come up later in our discussions, that you know, how is the landscape changing, and what can we do to adapt to this landscape, and how can we be more successful in it? Um, so we're gonna, I'm going to kind of ask them what the secrets of their success are, and ask them to share some hacks, practical hacks, secrets of software, and the unknown cousins of the chat GPT family that we can use to stay ahead. Um, and then we're gonna talk for about 40 minutes about what their observation of um, their audiences has been, what have been the trends, and all of them ha have two hats. They have many hats, but they have two hats in terms of their creators, and they're also consumers, they're also readers. So how it's affected them on both fronts, and then we are going to throw it open to mm -hmm. questions. 
So that's what the format is. And I'm going to ask our panelists to each introduce themselves, starting with Gayatri. Hi, I'm Gayatri Palajani. I'm the founder and director of the Bixney's content company. Uh, I actually, uh, I'm sitting here actually in context to literature and because I'm a ghost writer. I'm not somebody who writes about ghosts, as someone <laughs> once asked me. I just write, I just ghost write. Uh, uh, so basically, I, uh, books is what essentially I'm dealing with, in, like I said, uh, to this discussion. But I also direct and make films, and I do voiceovers as well. So it, this uh, discussion today is tri is tri has triple the relevance for me, because we're looking at AI in all these media. So uh, I look forward to seeing what's happening ahead. I think these are just a few of the books that uh, I have ghosted. One of them is an edited book. And yeah, let's see what happens. <laughs> Um, hey everyone, so this is Mansi. I'm the founder of kidstoppress.com. It's a discovery platform for parents, uh, right from conception all the way till their kids are about 16 years of age. I'm also a mother, I'm also a podcaster, author, YouTuber, um, and a yoga junkie. And I feel uh, this is briefly describing all the amazing things that each one of us does, right? I think I don't want to limit myself to just being a founder and CEO. I think I find that title very limiting. So. Yes, that's a little bit about me, and of course, the next one talks a little bit about my company and how we're using uh, technology to drive content, to consume content, and to produce content. So look forward to chatting with each one of you today on that. A very good evening. Uh, I'm Meghna Pant. I'm an author, screenwriter, uh, and an independent journalist. And people keep asking me whether the age of the great novelist, the age of the great novel, whether it's over, thanks to artificial intelligence, uh, NLPs, uh, generative AI, and all of that. And my answer is always this, that um, it's, AI is helpful, but it's not infallible. So it's like having a Rolls Royce, but having to drive it on Indian roads. And I'll get to that why. So in concept, it sounds fantastic, but the experience of it as a novelist and for literary aficionados is very different. And I'd love to get into that and dive into that as we go along. Hi, uh, my name is Tanud Solanki. I am I'm from Muzaffarnagar. I write fiction. So one of the books, one of the two books here has the name Muzaffarnagar and uh, a couple of awards. I'm the good old fashioned writer. I, write, I mean, I write my books, pen on paper, send them to publishers after typing. They publish it. Uh, that was the dream at least till 2013, 14 and things have changed rather rapidly, right? And so I'm having to adjust and I hope we get the opportunity, or I get the opportunity to you know, tell you how I'm adjusting, not very well. And I might also be the most pessimistic law of the, of the panelists here, but we'll discover that. I don't think good things will come out of AI, so yeah. <laughs> just one other thing though, I'm sorry. Um, so I'm not just a pessimistic writer, I also work in insurance, I'm, I, <laughs> I, I actually head the digital department in a major life insurance company, so in my day job, I deal with AI and I make it work, you know, but I'm pessimistic in the other side. And in your night job, you rebel against AI. That's an exciting paradoxical combination. So I'm Sonia Datta Chaudhary. I started life as a banker, but moved on to be a fairly traditional writer in terms of like a newspaper and, you know, report on interview artists and business people and all of that. Um, and then, you know, the literary algorithm happened and the world changed and newspapers changed. Uh, and then I started a Substack news newsletter, which was all the rage, you find authors like Salman Rushdie as well have Substack newsletters called, his, his is called the Sea of Stro Stories, the Sea of Stories. Um, and then uh, went on to start a books business, which, you know, to my great surprise took off because uh, it essentially means that I choose books for people and send them to them and they pay me for that book subscription service and I kind of thought it was a good fun thing but it worked out and I realized that that is one of the paradoxes of this very digital AI kind of age where uh, everything, uh, the, the algorithm will tell you what to read but you still 
at some point need people and this paradox comes when you actually look at the fact that even though people have become so digital in many ways um, there's still like a huge upsurge in attendance at literary festivals uh, people want to meet other readers socially so book clubs have become this big big thing um, and also you find you know people are actually meeting to sit and read together in parks. So if you're on Insta, you'll see Sobo Reads, Delhi Reads, Bangalore Reads, Cabin Reads. Um, so it's kind of a really interesting landscape. And so, um, you know, there's at one end, there's the whole, um, you know, if you look at Tanuj's, what he said, there is uh, doing AI by day, but there is a night movement of or also a counter movement, so to speak. Um, and uh, that's what makes this so fascinating. So I'm going to start by asking you, Meghna, uh, and Meghna's a novelist and she writes different genres, but you wrote a story. Uh, yeah. You got AI to write a story, right? Uh, what was the experience like? Did you like the story as a reader? Did it work for you? I was so relieved when I conducted this little experiment, uh, primarily for this talk, by the way. Uh, because I was so, I was pessimistic, like you, Tanoj, and I said I'm going to be replaced, I'm going to be redundant in another few years. But uh, suffice to say that uh, you might see my holographic image here speaking and anticipating my thoughts, but it's going to take five to ten years more. So AI is smart, it's helpful, but like I said earlier, it's not, it's infallible. So it's a supplement, but it's not a substitute yet for great literature. So I typed in a prompt uh, in chat GPT and a couple of other apps that uh, had been recommended for writing short stories that claimed to write even novels. And something as simple as a love story in Bhatinda. The guy, the AI algorithm throws this up somewhat, I'm paraphrasing here of course. Um, Daisy and David sit in a football field and have cupcakes as Mr. Coach watches them. What does this have? The context, the context is lost. So AI as it stands today is at least not a threat to Indian writers. And it really gave me great solace to see that AI has not yet been able to anticipate the great heterogeneity of our culture, uh, the deep complexity of the human experience, the lived experiences of humans, I think cannot be replicated yet by machines. Um, the fact is that, like I was, I'll come back to the analogy I made earlier about a Rolls Royce being driven on an Indian road. So yeah, if somebody gives you a Rolls Royce, you're like, I've arrived in life, right? I, I, I am the bomb or whatever. But the minute you have to drive it on an Indian road, you're going to face a lot of bumps. There are going to be potholes. Your back is going to break. And at some point, your tire will get punctured and you will not even reach your destination. So that's what AI is like. You can, uh, the, the algorithmic reasoning, uh, the computational analysis, the NLPs, they're fantastic for research, they're fantastic to help you structure perhaps your characters, even structure some of your plot points. Uh, if you're facing uh, a, a block, as a, if you're facing writer's block, it can help you sort of uh, brainstorm ideas. So it can be a companion in that way. Uh, it can even help you edit and proofread. But those are its limitation. The lived experiences of human beings, the emotional complexities of being a human, the fundamentally flawed experiences of us as human beings cannot be replicated. The pathos, the pain, the authenticity which we artists pour into our work cannot be replicated by a machine, not as it stands today. So and that's the key word today, right? As it stands and, today, again, in five to ten years. And I, so I want to go to uh, Tanuj, in fact, who's written a futuristic book. So while Meghna's got AI to write a short story, Tanuj has actually written about AI. Uh, and Tanuj, uh, the machine never learns, right? That's your novel. The machine is learning. The machine, oh. <laughs> this is so Freudian, right? <laughs> Meghna, I'm so taken in by your very optimistic view that human beings. <laughs> And so, and you said earlier you're pessimistic. So, do is AI something that we need to fear? And what's what's your take on it? The book is is very dark, isn't it? So, so when we, say, I mean, uh, just a clarification. When you say we, do you mean writers? Should writers fear AI? So, should writers and should also readers? Okay. okay. I mean, that's so, writers should. So, and here I differ from 
Meghna because yes, AI AI is not interested in living a life anyway, right? It has it has no hankering for lived experience. It doesn't want to feel any emotion. All it is trying to do is writers with all their lived experience, their heartbreaks, their uh, lived experience again. You know, what do they do? They produce text. They produce sentences which have for every language specific rules, subject and object and you know i mean we can go to grammar there uh, and it is trying to mimic that that is all it is trying to do so there is uh, for for ai to produce very very affecting text text that can make you cry it does not need to have lived any sort of life i mean that is proven by chat gpt anyway even today and it may not be so it may not catch certain uh, so uh, you know certain things like if it's set in Punjab, then it might still call the protagonist David, and uh, that it may not be able to do because it's not trying to solve for that problem right now. But if it sets its mind on it, or if some people get on it, they will solve it. Uh, the interesting thing here is that uh, in certain languages, where uh, you know uh, certain languages whose literatures are not digitized, are actually not going to get. Uh, that impacted you know and so it's english being the global language the biggest attack is actually going to be on english literature you know and uh, and us english writers are basically at the at the forefront b fighting the battle my my book uh, is actually not about so it was written before chat gpt uh, came to be what it is uh, and it uh, so it's it's a book it's a novel about uh, uh, NLP, natural language processing, and other AI tools, which will take away large number of customer servicing jobs, you know, like uh, across industries. And it is written from the perspective of a person who works in life insurance, but I can guarantee it is not a true story. Uh, which we means have it is, right? <laughs> no, it we have never implemented uh, anything of the sort, and as far as I know, we don't plan to. But the idea is that it's possible. And I realized in 2016, IBM came up with a product called Watson. It was uh, bought in India by the Manipal group of hospitals. And they started using that tool to study oncology uh, reports, you know, like cancer uh, diagnostics and all that. It was very successful. And 2017, I remember I was at my company and IBM started showing us what Watson could do. And this is this is nothing to do with what we regard today as the biggest threat. So it had already started in 2017. And that is when the idea for this book uh, came in my head. I'm like, oh my God, like this thing is going to wipe out jobs. And so my pessimism is not just about what it will do to writers. You know, writers are creative people, maybe we'll find something else. But uh, what it will do to uh, very labor-intensive economies and countries, uh, for example, India. So that's interesting. Can I just quickly? I'm sorry, but <laughs> she asked I mean, whatever. AI, sorry, I, I'm. Uh, it, what I found from AI is completely incoherent sentences. It took me longer to edit what it had thrown up than to actually having written it originally. And also, on the uh, to agree with in some way with what you're saying. It, I was talking about great writing, but if you want mediocre writing or bad writing, which unfortunately seen the success of Chetan Bhagat, we celebrate in India. We celebrate mediocrity. And of course, if you want AI to generate mediocre writing or bad writing and then celebrate it and buy that, then there's nothing that great writers can do. So I'm talking about a certain quality, an essence that only an extremely gifted writer can bring to the table, which I feel so far AI cannot. So there's a complete difference in opinions here and we are going to flip this and go to Mansi who is all things children and ask her to look into the future into the crystal ball because Mansi you advise parents on on what you know how to get their children to read so looking at the new generation what are some of the fears we need to deal with what are some of the things we can do as parents and as our generation to kind of help uh, protect our children at the same time to help them um, utilize these these technologies right um, so first up I'm um, you know I'll say I'm not someone who's against and maybe there's just one there's one aspect of tech and literature that we've looked into right now uh, one is that we need to understand that probably 
the class who just gave their class 10 was the last class that probably learned through textbooks. Children today are not learning through textbooks. YouTube is a larger school than the schools that we have in brick and mortar, right? So they are born, we are digital adopters, they're digital natives, which means that they learn in 3D, right? Now the minute you make it flat with just paper and text, it does not appeal to them. Um, it's also not very functional for them, and I am, I, I am, you know, I don't know if I'm supposed to be saying that I'm blamed as well, but I am as guilty as well because today, if I have to, I love, I can say very like non-writer language, that I love the smell of physical books and I love, you know, the turn of the paper and all of that, um, but it's not functional for me anymore. For somebody who reads a lot, today I have moved to, I know the Kindle has been there 10, 12, 14 years ago, but today it has become my first sort of preference because everything that I highlight goes back into, um, you know, it goes back into things that I've highlighted, it comes back to me when I actually need it. So I've made that technology functional for me, right? Like some days the randomness of the quotes that it reminds me of the highlights are just what I need on that day and no matter what I try to do manually, that'll never happen. So you're saying, Mansi, that this change is there to stay. And it, the, our children, the next generation, is going to live with AI I and probably not read novels. Are you saying no, that? No, I'm not saying that at all. I okay. think how you use technology to make it interesting, uh, make it more applicable is very, very important. Like I was mentioning when you know, we were discussing, if, you know, there's this museum I went to in Washington, D.C., where the minute you open a book for the child, AI will play out all the, supposing it's the, it's little women, right? And all the character, the page currently, all the pictures are laid out, a beautiful voice reads to you, almost like, you know, um, the author is trying to read or, or, or you know, the, the characters are playing aloud. Any child who even hates books will love reading, will fall in love with the process of storytelling. So for me, the medium can change, but as far as the end goal, the objective of falling in love with uh, literature, with art, with culture, with storytelling, at the end of the day, like Yuval Noah Harari said, what's the difference between animals and us? The only difference and the only thing that separates us from them is that we are great storytellers. That's the only difference. And that's what our kids need to learn. So if the form changes, I'm literally okay because yes, we're speaking of shorter attention spans. Um, we're speaking of digital natives. We're speaking of people who have shorter, you know, where content is being industrialized and produced um, at scale where we have more uh, time to produce than to consume, right? Uh, it's literally become that. It's a very, uh, it, it's like output needs to be like this. So, so Nancy, what you're saying is that parents and we as a generation should embrace this new technology and go with the flow and look at the possibilities of it. And, and it's, it's such a lovely example you gave, right, of Alice in Wonderland. And there was something else in the New York Times where there was this uh, fabulous app on translation. And they showed how uh, different kinds of, it was interactive, uh, how translation needs people so it was basically talking about human beings, but it was digitized and um, so that combination, which comes to what we were talking about in terms of machines being co-creators and Tanoj, you spoke about the whole emotion and how uh, machines actually AI can generate emotions, it's easy for them. Uh, and McKinsey has this article that was very quoted where they talked about machines as co-creators and they've kind of uh, picked up the research from MIT Media Lab where, where they collaborate. So we're looking at optimistic possibilities and on that note, Gayatri, you're very much at the forefront of uh, development of this age. Uh, Gayatri is the hottest kind of writer. Uh, everybody from <laughs> Prince <laughs> Harry to, to Nar perhaps even Narendra Modi wants the ghostwriter, right? Uh, because publishing barriers are down and anybody can tell their story. So Gayatri, like, what's 
it would be interesting to know that are the barriers really down or have they just changed like when people come to you saying we want to go straight a book uh, what's the kind what what do you tell them in terms of what what are their barriers are there money barriers are there time barriers creative barriers what's the landscape like so um there definitely what i have seen in the because i average about a book a year for the last 12 years so i've been doing this for about um, uh, yeah a decade a little over a decade and what i've seen is a flurry of requests the amount of people the number of people who want to write a book who think it's very easy to write a book uh, which is no uh, i don't mean this in a disparaging manner but once they start getting down to the process they realize that even after hiring a ghostwriter how labor intensive it is for them because i have to take on their voice i need to know you know not just you know what they do for a living but what kind of toothpaste they use in the morning essentially it's uh, some of it can be very awkward but it is what it is but uh, it is a the rise in personal branding has been immense so from from my perspective i'm seeing a rise of these kind of requests i can't keep up with uh, you know the requests fast enough that's basically the situation there are many things that i turn down because i just don't have the time so that is one aspect that i'm seeing in terms of what i do uh the other thing is that you can no longer be just a doctor you no longer can be just an actor you ha- there is a 24/7 news cycle going on content is 24/7 essentially in terms of you know what you're supposed to do so if you are trying to say okay i'm going to be like the writers past like a vikram seth or whatever then disappear into the you know into your fancy house in shropshire or wherever it is you do writing a book and then come back after 7 years there are many writers equally arguably equally or not equally talented who have taken your place so the sale of a book no longer depends on the book itself the sale of a book depends on the environment you create and the presence you create about that particular book so that's why if 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 certain authors that we don't agree with shall we say do very well it's also because they're very present so the um multimedia verse multiverse is we i mean that's the wrong way to put it but the firing on all cylinders is what i've noticed in 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 what i do that's that's so uh, per, uh you know perceptive and that's so interesting to know i mean it ties in with what we've noticed as well in terms of personal branding and it's a lesson to everybody that they even if you're not a writer if you're a reader you're still a professional and so you do need to uh, all of these rules the writing rules are really communicating rules so they apply to everyone who is a professional so b- before we move on i want to do a quick poll and amansi you talked about how you love the smell of books right and a lot of us like physical books so uh how many people actually read on this panel and in the audience so how many people prefer physical books hands up So wow this is like a huge majority and that's really the paradox and and so there is hope tanuj for the future <laughs> looks like we won't uh, you know it will be a kind of a collaborative uh uh set up multiverse um i wanted to ask uh everybody here what you know you've all moved from being traditional to digital to moving into the ai generated realm of creation so um what are the things that you've done in terms of keeping up uh figuring out what the trends are how do you do that and what are some things that have helped you like being very digital let me make it a listical and say what are the top two things that have helped you uh, starting with tanuj so uh so i haven't really used ai uh, to create anything neither in writing or uh, I, i did dabble with it in the sense that so i'm i'm writing a book it has a certain character who's who's wearing something on on a given day and uh, i want to see it for for it to be clearer to me as to how how she looks wearing that and so i dabble with dali dali I, i don't know how it's pronounced it's the text to image uh, ai and uh, I, i kept trying with different prompts till finally she kind of popped out you know exactly as she was in my head and that was quite something i mean it took it took me 10 minutes uh, i had to you know change the thing 
So that, uh, what's the use? Uh, I mean, did, did it do anything for me? Maybe it, it made it clearer. It made me change the description of the neckline. You know, uh, I, I remember that. So, uh, so yeah, in that sense, it, it, we were working together as a team, Dali and I. And the other thing that it has helped me do is, uh, there's also a lot of not so creative work that writers sometimes have to do. So let's say I have to uh, give a three day short story workshop and the party wants me to send a structure for the workshop, I just type it in chat GPT. I say three day uh, short story writing workshop schedule for 19 year old people <laughs> shoot. <laughs> and it gives me a perfect three day uh, structure. I just copy paste it and then edit it because you know, like they shouldn't figure out that I, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I do that and it makes it easy. So it, it is a productivity tr tool, you know, like, uh, and then I thought, you know, about my wife sh who, who has been a program manager, she has been a facilitator. And I looked at her and I said, this is how easy it is, you know, to design a program these days. And, and so we had some nice chats about it. And, and she did say that it cannot take away the human person. Of course, she said that. But I, I, as I said, I'm pessimistic. I think it just did, you know, like I, I just copy pasted the damn thing and <laughs> it worked. So, so that is where I've used it uh, to be more productive in oh the that, more those banal. Are, those are great hacks. So dabble with Dali, the text to image software, and also use it for routine stuff. So it just frees you up to do the creative stuff. Make the. So I think a lot of NOE and also this obsession with upskilling all the time. So even my career, I've gone from being a banker. Uh, to becoming a finance journalist. I worked with Ornab Goswami, that was my first job. You don't have to pity me too much, but that was my first job. Uh, I was a journalist and an independent journalist, and then I became an author, and even in uh, writing, like you've mentioned, I'd write in different genres. So I've written novels, short stories, nonfiction, and now I'm writing screenplays for movies, uh, and also web series. Uh, so I'm a big believer that change is the only constant, and as a creative person, I also suffer a lot from ennui, which means I get bored very easily. So the minute I've accomplished something, I'm setting myself a new goal. And this is just, uh, I think it's, it, that's why I'm embracing AI, because like Gayatri also mentioned, uh, this collaborative storytelling for me is the future, where AI and humans come together to create masterpieces that would not be possible for either to do in a standalone basis. I also believe that immersive uh, sort of augmented reality books are the future. Like Mansi mentioned, uh, you know, there's so many apps today that are throwing up animated versions of children's stories, like The Little Mermaid, like you mentioned, or Little Women, or uh, I, I read that, I, I see that with my kids as well. Uh, so I think augmented reality, where the books, the stories that you're telling, find a larger audience because it's so immersive, the experience. So I don't, as a storyteller, my aim is that as many people should read my story as possible. So for me to embrace new technology, if it helps me achieve that goal, I don't see why I should be so circumspect about it or why I should be, you should be cautious. And you should also be very smart. So what Tanuj had mentioned was prompt engineering, right? You put in specific things in chat GPT that can help you with your social media or with your emails. It can't help you with writing a good story. So you use it where it's effective and also be a smart consumer of AI. And by smart consumer, I mean whether if you give away your plot, this technology is mimicking everything and then anticipating what is happening next. This AI as it stands today needs us humans more than we humans need it. Now, if we empower it and enable it by revealing, for example, as a novelist, I type in my best story idea that nobody else in the world has thought of. What am I doing? I may never finish that story, but what have I gone and done? I have given IA access to a great story, which it will then recapture and regurgitate to some other uh, new writer, and that writer will use it to build his or her own story. This is so interesting, what you're saying. And this, this could be the you know, basis for a story, but it's a slippery slope, right? Because somewhere, you, if your story gets published, yeah. which it will for sure, that it will be uh, accessible to AI again. And that comes back yes. to Tanaj's book about the machine always learns, right? Yeah. 
is always learning. But don't, but, don't make uh, it too capable. Don't I mean, make be it smart too capable. About okay, so don't make any say. programmers here. Don't make it too capable. I also noticed that both of you are kind of agreeing on the possibilities and embracing AI just for the functionality from that mode. So, and you, you, you were talking, Meghna, about how you've uh, kind of moved to audiobooks in a big way, even with your kids, and, and that's that's one aspect, right, of um, uh, which is, again, paradoxical, because storytelling, when it started, was really oral, and, and yeah. audiobooks have become such a big thing. Not, so, yeah, not just audiobooks, even apps like Epic, uh, you guys should really try it if you have, I have a small kid, I have a three-year-old and a six-year-old. And it reads aloud the books for your child. So I have a ritual every night. I read two to three books to both my girls. And they love books. And uh, I want them to always love books, but I want them to love books and stories in all formats. Because like you, Mansi mentioned, they're digital natives, right? So Epic, for instance, will read out stories to them when I'm feeling too tired. It will read alongside my child, my six-year-old, who's learning how to read. So her vocabulary will get better and better. So again, I'm using AI to my own benefit and to my own child's benefit. So again, I don't, there's so many apps today. There's Story Berries, which uh, gives f access to free children uh, stories. There's Wooks, which is virtual books, which again provides these um, immersive experiences. It throws up, uh, you know, animated stories. So it'll take your story, or it'll take a story of Cinderella and throw it up in an animated form for the child to see. So I'm saying anything that draws people further into storytelling, according to me, is a big win. Is a big win. So you have Dali, you have Epic, uh, Mansi, you are... Uh, I just I wanted to add something. I just want to temper talks of the future with what is currently the present scenario in publishing. Uh, uh, every six months or so, I call up one of my publishers that I work with and I say, am I obsolete? They say, no. <laughs> and I asked them, I said, so tell me what's happening with e-books. Very simple question that I ask them. What's happening with e-books? E-books has, has stubbornly remained at 15% of the total uptake. That means that 85% of books are still paperback or hardback. There's still physical copies, and this reflects global trends. The audiobooks, uh, the audience is even slimmer. I voice audiobooks as well. Not a great revenue stream, but I voice it. And uh, the, uh, the market is even smaller. So while, yes, it's extremely relevant to have conversations about the future, the current scenario does not reflect the speed at which some people anticipate the uptake of this technology, which is the point I wanted to make. That, that's so interesting. And the statistics are surprising, right? Because we're surprising. all talking about how it's changing. Mansi, um, you are kind of in the next digital uh, native generation, right? What Do you think it's going to accelerate? Um, first of all, let me tell you, I'm extremely overwhelmed sitting here listening to all of this conversation. I'm just like... Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Like uh, fearful of AI overwhelm? No, no, I'm never fearful of anything because if you fear, then you fall, right? I love uh, that. If you fear, then you fall. Alliteration. <laughs> um, hopefully, so it my, So my point is that um, for me, it's not about saying AI yeah, can do this, AI yeah, cannot. How can AI work for me? And to your point, and to adding to what Meghna said, for me about audiobooks, it's about understanding what works for your child? What works for you? We need to understand the different types of people, right? Some people learn better visually. Some listen. Some people have heightened auditory skills. Some people have higher kinesthetic skills. So it is about identifying what works for you, what works for your child. A child who's dyslexic will always find solace in reading with an audiobook, or listening, rather, with an audiobook, right? So the idea is not to be closed to uh, a particular form. Uh, because I remember once I posted about um, me re listening to an audiobook and somebody commented, that's not even reading. And I'm like, you know, how? Like, I, I don't understand, right? You need to make, um, what do you read for? You read for joy, you read for, uh, you know, you read for knowledge, you read to spark curiosity, learn about culture, whatever the case may be for each one of us, right? The form, what I'm trying to constantly say is the form will evolve, it will change, but and it needs to work for that specific person to say uh, to to say that what is going to be the future. I think, like Meghna said, that the future is going to be what we feed into the system. Right. Um, recently, I was listening to this podcast by Adam Grant, uh, where he had this brilliant Nigerian storyteller called 
something Thotson. It was a tough name. But what he said is exactly what Meghna said in the past, which we need, we are building the, the speed at which AI is pulling us like, um, like a car which is over 120 kilometers per hour in a direction which is a wider path created from a very narrow base of knowledge is, is what we're going into. With very little knowledge, you're trying to predict what it's going to be like, right? And that's, that's extremely tough. So my point is that I don't know what the predictive part of it could be. Of course, you can write. But I think for children, and which I keep reiterating, and I keep sharing this um, on Kids Stop Press with parents and with children, is be very careful of what you're feeding into this machine. Because tomorrow, when your children and what you, and especially on privacy and protection, while we're speaking of all this, you know, all of the uh, other stuff, what is very important is that we're leaving a digital footprint behind for every single thing. Tomorrow, people who are going to give you home loans, bank loans, university applications may not be humans, right? So every digital footprint that you leave behind is what AI is going to make a decision on. So therefore, you may say, OK, you know, post, and, and therefore what I tell you know, a lot of teenagers, parents of teenagers as well, or, or young adults or children, is that make sure that whatever your kids are posting or sharing or what you're putting up is not something you will ever, ever regret in the future. Because decisions are going to be made using that past to feed into the future. That's such sound advice, Mansi. And it's also so tough, right? Because at this point in time, you do say things, and people do say things. And prime ministers have fallen, and, and people have lost their jobs because of things they've said or done that are recorded. Uh, it's, it's a good segue into what, we, uh, what is a useful thing to talk about next, which is what should we be afraid of in terms of AI? And Gayatri, I want to ask you, you spoke earlier about regulation and the whole, you know, the plagiarism thing, right? Meghna says you feed in things, the machine knows it, and before you know it, your exact words or your your copyright, your thoughts, your ideas, your creativity um, can be stolen. And there have been cases of this reported where, um, you know, there was something on Twitter where a writer was complaining that somebody else had used her style because you can say write a story in the style of uh, Shakespeare or Enid Blyton and AI can do that very well and they actually sold it and there was no protection so um, you know what what could some of those challenges I be? I guess uh, the fundamentally the basics or, or of any sort of regulation is the fact that I want to know if the content that I'm reading is AI generated right for me it's really important uh, for example, there was a furor, and I'm giving a slightly older case in 2013, the World Press Photography Awards. I don't know if anybody is aware of this controversy. Uh, there was a photograph that was slightly doctored. I think it got to do. It was got. To, it had had to do with uh, a man carrying, you know, a child out of a Palestinian war zone or something like that. And there was a furor over whether it was photoshopped or not photoshopped, because fundamentally, in the age of digital technology, it's very easy to do that. So. Why I'm cautiously optimistic, and I say this very cautiously and optimistically, is because uh, we cannot separate the human need for originality, the human need for connection. What AI will generate is a stream, a plethora of standardized content. And standardized content doesn't connect. If I'm ghostwriting for um, an 89-year-old Parsi gentleman, there is no way that I can generate this. Even if I use all the Parsi tropes in the world, I'll be shot dead by most Parsis anyway. But if I use it like that, it'll be badly done. So the fundamental need, which is why I'm not too afraid of what's go what lies ahead, comes only through originality. And AI is fundamentally based on the past. It's not based on the future. It's past content. It's not future, it's not original. Can we generate an Oppenheimer through AI? I don't think so, because it hasn't been generated yet in the head, right? It's not been generated yet in content. That's one aspect of you know, the reception of AI. My other problem is with regulation, right? If I want to read a book, I need to know that if this is about a Sri Lankan war zone, that it's not been generated by AI. We need to tag all content generated by AI as AI-generated content and AI-generated AB, and AI-generated film, to know that this has been done through computers. I don't relate to computer-generated content. It doesn't make me, it doesn't satisfy me to read. 
the books that have fundamentally shaken me to the core are essential extensions of the human experience. So I need to know regulation, but not just plagiarism, not just taking somebody's art. What am I reading? And is it an original experience? And then it's of meaning to me. When things start to lose value is when they get easy to do. And AI makes it easy to do. And therefore, it loses value. So I just see a situation where, like e-books, with this 15% penetration and paperback books, AI will also be coexisting with content. Nothing to necessarily be afraid of, but it is in partnership. It, there's a st stream of that. There'll be a whole bunch of, uh, there'll be a massive audience that likes text message books. There's, that started in Japan 15 years ago, right? There's these, uh, they call WhatsApp books or text message books or whatever it is. There'll be a whole uh, audience for AI-generated content, AI-generated fan fiction, but there'll also be an audience that wants true, unshakable, pure human experience. So you see it as a combination, I nothing to fear, and co-created, uh, uh, that's something co-created with so machines, raise the bar, bar even higher for creativity. We need to get different and creative, but you're also cautiously optimistic and, I, and, and you're supporting that when you're saying that we need to seriously look at regulation, which is not in place yet, where it's mandatory to actually declare that this is yes. AI generated. And, and so that, that's something that's a really important takeaway. I just wanted to add the part where I read about Harvard Business School study. It was a HBR report. Uh, and it basically said that humans may won't replace, be replaced by AI, but humans with AI will replace humans without AI. That's so, so beautifully said. And not by me, unfortunately. Humans. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I said it, but I haven't. But you've <laughs> quoted it with an attribution. Correct, correct. Which correct. is perfect, correct, right? Yeah. So uh, that's, that's, uh, that sums it up so well. Uh, going back to, so we kind of cautiously optimistic, so we'll go to the optimistic and the cautious. <laughs> and uh, what... What are your biggest fears about AI? I mean, um, there is, of course, uh, lots. One is from the writer's point of view, but even as a reader yourself, and there's a lot of research that says that the algorithm is going to recommend to you the same sort of books that you've read before. So you're, at some point, if you just listen to the algorithm, you're going to be in a kind of echo chamber. And AI itself, like your David and Delaney, uh, you know, it's going to be mainstream. And um, Tanoj, you also spoke about how AI is um, uh, and I, I want you to elaborate on that because that was very interesting that AI is at the end of the day owned by the big corporations. So it will be safe. It will not be radical or rebellious. So is that something if we kind of surrender the creative and book writing um, project to AI, uh, is it going to be really uh, bad for us as readers? Uh, what's your thoughts on that? So. Um so first of all, I think uh, what was just said, uh, so there's a law, I think, in economics, Grisham's law, it says that when there is too much of bad coins in the market, they drive away the good coins. So my fear is, is not so much that uh, AI will write like James Joyce. Uh, it may happen, may not happen. But the fear is that there will be so much AI-generated narratives and stories that the good ones will automatically be driven out of the market. When I say driven out of the market, the price, uh, I, I'm talking about the fact that everything will be priced. So, so you would be able to buy a novel for 10 paise, right? And where does that leave me? The other argument is that maybe, maybe, uh, the novel by me will be 10,000 rupees then, right? So that's the hopeful scenario where, where anything written by a human actually becomes uh, an item of luxury, but I am pessimistic largely because there is also a lot of humans writing. <laughs> you know, so that so the idea of a ten thousand rupee novel doesn't really hold. Uh, and the, so for people like me, people who write uh, novels, there is a bit of a crisis at hand. I mean, uh, novelists like Paul Tremblay, uh, they have sued OpenAI uh, because they think that uh, their texts have been fed into the machine and they are, they are basically producing. So there is, and that uh, judgment will have repercussions on the threats that I face today uh, as a writer of fiction. So I'm very, very happy about what Paul Tremblay has done. The other thing as to, let's say he, he doesn't win, you know, and, and in the US they say that, okay, whatever is out in the public domain, you know, maybe OpenAI can consume it and so on and so forth. 
Now, if that happens, then for writers like me, it throws up a, a big aesthetic challenge, right? How do you respond to this problem, wherein it can pretty much do what you do? And uh, ChatGPT writes what it writes because it, uh, you know, it knows whatever has been written till date. That is pretty much why I write what I write, right? I have I have read what I have read, which makes me capable of writing what I write today. So we are not very different from each other. The one difference is I'm not owned by Microsoft, right? And I'm not an international business that wants to sell books in Africa as well as North America. And so I don't have to do a middle line of respectability, not causing offense, you know, not being not being you know, not being shady in certain areas. And what I have consolidated this entire line of thought is to say, I must be more perverse. You know, uh, as, as, as someone who writes fiction for adults, at least, I have to be more perverse, perverse to a degree, and that has to somehow embed into my aesthetics. I'm not saying perverse in a very narrow sense. I'm, I'm using the word in the broadest possible sense here. I need to be perverse in a way that uh, a corporation's text cannot be. So we're right. really excited to read your next book now. <laughs> so rebellious, perverse. And to that, I'll add my own experience of personal. So I started writing as a journalist where the I was not part of the story. You just had to report on people and you were supposed to be this invisible person who just talked about the people. And then um, I started to write a books column where I recommended books to people. And then um, one day I opened chat GPT, you know, like five great reads to read when you're on an airplane or, or books which are um, you know give you a sense of the landscape things like that and I opened chat GPT and I uh, typed in this prompt and I was horrified to find five perfectly good books um, which I might have suggested so I was like oh my god my column is defunct however I did find that um, I did write certain things about myself in the column. So I'd write that, okay, you know, I'm in, uh, I'm diving and I'm in the Andamans and I can see these, um, you know, uh, uh, kind of, um, and what is Nemo? The clownfish. The clownfish around me and then uh, da, da 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 whatever about a little bit about my experience and then I'd write the books that I was reading and then uh, I found that readers were responding positively to that as well. So the mix of the personal that okay this is what I'm doing so I'm, I'm telling you about books in the Andamans but that's because I'm also there and so there was the whole personal brand. And so it was an effort for me because I had been taught, like, suppress yourself. You don't have to talk about your personality. But now I that's what I do in my column. I write about myself and what I'm doing and how the books that I'm recommending are part of my life. And Meghna, you were also saying something about this, that how you didn't want to put yourself and you, you're shy to put yourself on social media, but you found you just had to. I'm uh, naturally a, uh, not a tech maven, I'm a tech cretin, uh, I'm a philistine when it comes to technology, but I've found in today's world, jo dikta hai, wo bikta hai. so unfortunately, jo even, if you're, a great, hai, wo bikta hai. Nice <laughs> even if you're a great novelist, if you don't know how to sell your books, then nobody will hear of your books, and then therefore nobody will buy your books, and then the publisher will not publish your books, so you'll be made redundant by the mere fact that you don't exist on social media, now I think the future will be AI. But the concerns that I want to quickly address, which you had mentioned of writers, is a deep faking of authors, which I think Tanuj was also mentioned in passing. There's this author, uh, uh, Jane uh, Reedling, or oh, I'm forgetting her name. Uh, somebody put up books under her name on Amazon. These were not books written by her, and on Goodreads. So she found out about it and then she approached Goodreads and Amazon and said, take it down. Now here comes uh, the perverted part. Uh, Amazon said that we are not a direct infringer. They're contributory infringer, so we can't do anything about removing the books. Her name is not trademarked and her book, there's no copyright on the books because she has not generated this book. Now look at the tricky bit. You're an author who's facing reverse plagiarism. You've been deep faked. And your hands are tied. So she, uh, Jane Friedman, I think her name is, she took to social media and it created a furrow and that's why she got uh, Goodreads and Amazon removed the books. So we, need, we need regulation. We need Coming so back unregulated to, yeah. AI is definitely not the way forward. The Writers Guild of America has also mentioned this, that even if a writer 
types in a prompt into chat GPT and generate something, they should get credit. They should get uh, Amazon and, and everybody, all the AI companies, to uh, give them credit, to seek their consent, and to give them compensation. Because it's almost a sort of economic violence on writers with this unregulated AI. So I think the conversation is going to further deepen into what is unregulated and regulated. But remember, unregulated like crypto, we've seen its fate. Yeah. So how long do, will we exist without these regulations when it's affecting millions of writers across the world? So I think the, the, these are the nuances that we have to pull out of the conversation of unregulated versus regulated. Uh, there was Hari Kunzru who had also mentioned that uh, a website, I think called Prosecraft, would pick up authors' books, analyze them to help new writers compare their writing and then emulate the writing of writers they aspire to be. Again, done without consent. So and this all, these are all really clever things. Down. These are but, very clever things. But, but they need to actually be there and uh, be regulated. Uh, by the way, writers do that all the time. They emulate other writers. <laughs> they they really invest in researching the other writers' work. I think good writers copy, great writers steal. <laughs> yeah, so it's uh, exactly. On that note, we throw it open to audience for questions. Just to add one thing, there's the Nielsen Book Report of 2022. You should see that the facts there are quite uh, quite alarming, including that uh, obviously uh, audiobooks are going to overtake e-books. But also about the size of the market in India being the most populous country in the world and the largest amount of English speaking, what it's doing for the publishing industry. So just check out that, that report. It's quite so it's helping the publishing industry? I mean, it's not help. I mean, it's, it's the market is there, but how is India taking advantage of it? If I can just add to that, currently where the publishing industry stands, there is a rise in the um, level of uh, buybacks in, in books, where books are concerned. So what is happening is publishers are struggling with a, a revenue model for um, publishing, uh, for, for books. So a lot of my clients who want to write their books have to buy back their own copies. That's one aspect. And they're also starting uh, their own custom publishing units. So revenue generation at the moment is really, really uh, difficult. And marketing, though, I suppose, don't, don't get me started. Uh, precisely, precisely. So I really hope this works, but uh, currently as it stands, it's uh, pretty, shall we say, I, I mean, uh, Tanush talks about a 10,000 rupee book, that's lifestyle, that's lifetime sales for, for <laughs> essentially for a book, so <laughs> it's unfortunately how it is. So that's basically the story, but yeah, I hope so. Hi, uh, my name is Vivina and work, I work for a bank. Uh, it was a fabulous session and great to hear you all. Uh, my question is um, something that we see right now when you read Economic Times, uh, on the internet, you will see certain stories will have a disclaimer that this is AI generated. Uh, where are, there are long form stories which you re then read in say AD Prime or behind the paywall. paywall. Um, my question is about, uh, bo about authors. Will there be a situation then, since we are discussing that we don't need to be, you need to be seen and you need to, in a world of social media, that probably somebody like Vikram said or is working on a book for seven years, in between, there would be bouts of books, which is AI generated. And will that kind of put you where you are not right now, which kind of aligning, probably the, so I was a journalist earlier, so may, there are months that you put in, like uh, for two months or three months, and the story, the long form stories do not get that much views, whereas a bread and butter story, which you have hardly just written because there was, uh, you have to write it that day, gets you probably 10, 20,000 views. So will that kind of a scenario emerge? That's such a great question. And I think uh, so different kinds of art and like the shorter snippets and the larger ones. Um, and I think uh, everybody on this panel who's on social media, um, Mansi, do you want to start? What's your view on that for different formats? And um, so I, I mean, I wouldn't be able to comment as a, uh, you know, whether the bread and butter part of it, but because I'm from the digital space and I would only say that on digital, and I think it's a great benchmark to go to because attention spans are shrinking. Like three-hour movies are now 20-minute episodes running over, you know, uh, a season or whatever. Um, we follow something which is called a three-second audition. That's a rule. For any content that we're producing, the human attention is now not more than three seconds. So I tell my team that if it does three not... Three-second audition. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. If it doesn't cross that, we can't publish this. And you can get, obviously there are, there are 
you know, there are restricted ways of getting it and you don't uh, kind Can of you say it. more about that? So if you have a piece that's how long and then you're saying after three seconds people are not watching. So we're talking, I'm talking more of an on, on like a video or an audio format, yeah. right? Uh, not as much as written. Even if it's written, we, we spend at least uh, in the digital publishing space, we spend probably 85% or maybe 75% in writing the title and of our time and 25 to 35% in writing the rest of the piece. 85% on the title and 25? 75, roughly around 70, 75 is a good title, you know, time to spend on your title in the digital space and about the, the balance on writing. Uh, the rest of the piece, right? I, I mean, in terms of time span, right? And that's very important because you can do whatever you want. But if you don't find that piece, that headline, and mind you, that's not only with whether AI is generated it, human is generated, whoever is generated it. At the end of the day, what, what Gayatri said was brilliant. We are looking for connection, right? We're talking of 15% ebook sales, 10%, whatever numbers were quoted. We are a population of 1.2 billion people alone in India, right? Look at the reach that we need to garner. Look at the number of people who need to start reading or listening. I don't know when was the last time I typed. I, me and my kids are only voice noting. My team and me are only voice noting. So you right? need instant connection and, and you need like three so seconds parts, is really instant. Two parts. You have to have within those three seconds, you need to tell your story. Wow. You need to tell me what's Okay, I want to ask this to the novelists, okay? Three seconds. Okay, what's your take on this, Meghna? Three seconds to tell your story, not 250 pages. So three I seconds is the promo. The story can be like 10 seconds. But three seconds, seconds. okay. You have <laughs> 10 you seconds. Get the user. So, you know, the Gita says that you shouldn't focus on the outcome of your actions. Just focus on your She's actions. She's become philosoph philosophical and now. No, because <laughs> I, I'm not a performance artist. My brother, for example, is a stand-up comedian and he's famous. And I'm very proud of him. And I, I'm surrounded by mega influencers and comedians and actors and... They're all very famous and I'm very happy for them. But they keep asking me, I'm not a performance artist. I'm the opposite. I'm a creative artist. I actually, honestly, if it wasn't for the fact, like I just mentioned, you dikta hai, wo bikta hai, you would never see me. I would sit in an ivory tower and keep typing away. I would not make public appearances. That's what I want from my life. I don't want to be recognized. I don't want to be adulated. I don't even want awards. I just want to write good stories and be left alone. So what you want to make of your life, and if you're getting that, why are you comparing yourself to anybody else? Like so a digital per a person, a person on digital media. Do what you're doing. Do what and, you do and, and do it no, well. I, I would yeah. like to add there that it's not that a person or a creator or you know all of Saurabh's friends or other people who are creating either funny content or Hindi poetry or all of that on digital are not. According to me, they are the and I, I'm from a marketing background. I feel they have the most powerful consumer insights ever whether it's talking about you know and and i'm a gujarati and i follow this guy called viraj gilani i don't know how many of you guys do he is he may not be the best writer but he has the most fabulous human connection on a rainy day where the world is posting about coffee and masala chai and this and that he's talking about being stuck in traffic in mallard for three hours like he doesn't need to be most articulate. He needs to be, to be real. More asked, most articulate about his yeah. feelings. Yeah. Yeah. That's my being, point. Being your own authentic self, your truest yeah. self, I think that's will carry you through life. And comparing yourself to somebody else in terms of is long form going to work, is short form going to work. I've written flash fiction. I've written you know every all sorts of formats and mediums because in the end, it's not the medium that matters. It's the story that matters. It can be told in a sentence. It can be told in a moment. It can be told in a, a, a hundred and fifty thousand word epic. So don't constrain yourself. Just go out and do the best that you can in whatever field you're in. I mean, nowadays AI is in you know there are AI generated uh, ro robotic surgeons. There's AI sculptures being made. There's uh, my husband's a lawyer. Uh, you know, legal contracts have been generated by AI. So in all fields across the world, AI is going to have an impact. It's not just writers or digital creators or ghost writers. It's going to be consumed all over the world. So how do we make the best of it and how do we stop comparing and living in fear? Because I think, like you said earlier, right? Yeah. There's so no choice now. And, and what's coming out from what you say is that you're experimenting across formats. So you're doing the short. So there is the... And so, and we're not sure which of these will be the bread and butter, but 
creators are experimenting between mediums, between formats, between lengths. Um, and that's, that's the key. And probably and the bread and butter answer. will be the three As seconds. I, but, uh, just I hope you got your answer. No, but people who are writing long form articles, they, I think their goals are slightly different also. And long form articles or reportage or whatever, uh, it has an archival quality. And which is the same way I would say, uh, you know, a novel will, will not understand the three second, 10 second language because a novel has pretensions of art, it has aspirations of art. Uh, but the attention spans also impact novels or any long form writing. Uh, I think writers of my generation, because we are also in a attention uh, snap, sorry. Yeah, so uh, writers of my generation are finding it difficult to write big novels. And uh, like people who, uh, writers who are today probably uh, more than 50 years old or you know in the 60s, uh, there is a clear difference that you can see if you aggregate uh, across uh, you know a, a, a sizable sample writers my generation are writing smaller books and such they take an and, and they take longer space. to write those books they take long it's such an interesting space though because when you look at the history of literature you you know people have said the novel is dead so many times in the past when television came the novel is dead when the internet came the novel is dead uh, but we do see that book sales are rising so it's um, a great space to just look at and do we are aware that yes attention spans are shrinking, but you know, there is. If I may just add, Sonia, also to your point, uh, look at people who are drawing in the subscriptions, right? Whether it's the Ken, whether it's the Morning Context, whether it's the New York Times, who's also making money on content. But if you see the buy, if you, if, and very long form pieces, and we're all paying for them, or at least some of us are paying for them, the, the title or the, the, a sense of what they're trying to say is very articulate in those eight words. So each of these publications are given a mandate of eight words or nine words or so much because the brevity of your thoughts, because the consumer is so time pressed, we may want to write long form, I'd love to, but at the end of the day, I also have a business to run. So I, I get your point in terms of a, a normal bread and butter piece and long form. But it's also what your subscription model is, what's your revenue model, it'll all depend on that. I hear two things in what you say, and one is that some of us are paying for the long form. So there will always be some people who will go for that, and the numbers may be less, which which basically answers your bread and butter question. Um, and uh, you need to hook in people for that. Yes. Yesterday I was pointed to an article where the New York Times is now prohibiting a change its terms and conditions where chatbots can't go in and yeah. train their, their, their systems based on free content. You actually have to pay. So New York Times is starting and others are going to follow. Yeah, and brilliant user experience. So they can charge that premium for that long form because they're providing you with that experience. I mean, try reading the New Yorker on the app and you'll know what I mean. They're investing back for you to pay in long form content. So but the co-creation co here. It's still very visual because their images are absolutely brilliant. For every story or at least some of the stories, they have a video playing uh, which makes the story come alive for a reader. So it depends also on the user experience uh, and I said also about an individual, right? How do you consume content? Like for me, everything's audiovisual. So, uh, or for 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 you know younger kids, it's more audio. Um, so it completely depends on what your primary uh, mode of communication and, and subscription model or revenue is. So long versus short. That was uh, very very many interesting aspects that came up. Yes, uh, question. <laughs> Yes, what, what is your preference in terms of receiving material, audiovisual or whatever? But you know, we lived in a world where there were no images, almost. Now we are inundated with images. And so I wonder if my granddaughter is better off looking at a page and using her imagination rather than having something <coughs> audiovisual or the books that you talked about, you know, where images pop up to support the text and all that. Lovely, 
But when we are already bombarded with images, children are watching cartoons and all, do we need more of this? Or do we need a quieter space in which you just look at a page and I'll allow your imagination to go where it wants to go and also to retain more of what you read? So, Mansi, I know you will have the last word on this, but I want to ask Sanoj to come into this from um, What's your take? Because you're the. Crowd I, crowd I was crowd actually crowd. thinking of Alice in Wonderland, uh, and Alice doesn't like books that don't have pictures. So I was just reminded of that, and I think uh, that book came out late 19th century. So even in you know even then it was I think it was clear to people who were writing for children that there will need to be some <laughs> some pictures in those books. I, I think it was it being. I mean, as as someone who only writes, who only produces text, I think if, if that were to happen, I would be the happiest. <laughs> so I totally so, so if I was to add, it all depends age-wise, right? Why do we make our children play with toys, only primary colors, red, blue, yellow, green? They may be looking ghastly, but that is what the, the child's eye can actually... Um, you know, that's that's how their visual senses are developing, right? Only primary colors. Until a certain age, children can only see visual. That's why children's books largely in the infancy and the first thousand days of life will largely be picture books. Post that, you start introducing a few letters. Please understand, and music. Music has only seven notes. English language has over 100,000 words to learn from, right? So whether it's music, vis whether it's audio, whether it's, you know, like I said, whether it's music, whether it's visual, there are fewer parts to learn than language, right? So language actually is introduced last to children. Of course, you will find a whole lot of books which will now also have the no picture book. It's a very popular children's book which actually has no pictures at all and it's left to the child's imagination. The, the book that I'm talking about and this, this, or, you know, this audiovisual experience, that is an experience. That's not an at-home um, thing that I'm asking everyone to create, right? That's, that's not possible. Uh, so most definitely one needs to read. I mean, there are immense number of studies that are drawn to, the, to repetition of books, to visuals of books, to the same voice being um, used and having a connection with the child to have certain effects on the child's mood or to put them to bed or you know whatever uh, calm them down if they're having a tantrum or whatever so every stage will have a different um, picture non-picture audio kindle version of that book of of you know which version you want to adapt to like i said audio is great for a child who has reading disability right so use it for that also understand if your child is better at absorbing in audio than in video or in text. Even when selecting videos, it is very important what is the animation pace because very fast-paced animation can actually kind of, uh, you know, slow down their new, uh, neurological growth because the, the images are coming much faster than what they can absorb, right? So even that has a lot of science to it. So it completely depends at what age and stage. I may use the Kindle. My daughter has now started using the Kindle because she is 11. Was she using it back when she was four and five and six and eight? No, she wasn't. But everything is part of an evolution and visual is a very strong cue for children. Very, very strong. We are never, we've never taught them um, these are spectacles. We've always told them, go get those spectacles. They've assumed that those are spectacles, right? Uh, so that's just like books when you're reading the bear was red, right? She knows red as a color and she's assumed that's a bear. So that's the connection that words will have to visuals. So, so there's, a, there's a richness of forms now and, and a richness of, of so many different senses and content produced that caters to different senses. But yeah, the challenge is that we are bombarded with so much content and how do you curate? And, and I, th I think the key is to just allow your children to get bored and I'm very different from the other parents of my generation because I find I'm, I disagree so much with the parenting styles because people today, the young parents, are all inundating their children with endless forms of imagery, classes, and, and, and I think the one thing that coexists is we're not allowing our children to get bored. So when my kids say, 
that they are getting bored, I actually celebrate that. I'm like, you have to get bored every single day. That's how your creative imagination will grow. Your personality will grow. So allow your children to get bored away from all these apps and this whole new world that they're entering into. Uh, while with conversations about children and attention spans and media and attention spans, uh, even uh, since I've been writing books for 12 years, the uh, kind of books I have to write now, um, the language has to be a lot more accessible. So the novel may not be dead, but the era of painful prose is certainly dying. So even when it comes to a Sally Rooney, whose books are outstanding, it's very layered, but it's very economical. So the writing has become economical and accessible, which is a trend I'm seeing in order for greater absorption of the message. So what people want to do, or writers want to do, is they want to take away the frills of you know trying to sound too fancy or inauthentic, and they want to make a, a greater, stronger connect. So while it does play into what you're saying about you know, short uh, spans. Even the style of writing is now being designed for greater, uh, for shorter attention spans. I think now a lot of all the their laptops, and all their various devices, is on their eyes. It has certainly affected my grandson's eyes. And when we go to the eye doctor, ophthalmologist, he says he's getting younger and younger kids are wearing spectacles now. When, uh, need glasses and he anticipates this trend growing. So how do we deal with this? That, that's like any how, you know, we were actually, yeah, and I'm going to, I'm going to ask Mansi to say this yeah. because, to respond to this, because Mansi came up with just a few, uh, half an hour ago, she said something that she said that she does, her kids don't have the concept of screen time at all. No, no, so. They have, and now, they have no it. concept of limited screen time. And, and the whole logic to that is that there's no concept that you have 30 minutes of screen time or 60 minutes of screen time or 90 minutes of screen time. Because the logic to doing that is that when it is restricted, it's desirable, right? I agree, ma'am. So, so the, the key is that there is no escaping uh, to technology. And yes, by the way, Asia, Asians are the most myopic, uh, myopia-prone um, uh, continent uh, by, by genetic code. So therefore, you will see a lot of children getting, uh, you know, being myopic. Uh, and that is a very, very, very unfortunate thing. But the, the key there to understand is nothing is happening on its own. Like AI is not saying, hey, you know, or, or Siri is not saying, hey, switch on YouTube for 30 minutes for my child. Somebody is giving that prompt. Who is that prompter, right? So my key would be to ask yourselves and, and the custodians of these children that where is that coming from? Schools are almost back to normal. If we are saying that we're going to treat screens as babysitters, then of course we're going to face this problem, right? Uh, and you know, just this morning I moderated a panel on the importance of play. And there was a brilliant study uh, which the Lego group published, which is called 95% of children say that they enjoy playing with their parents, but the parents don't play back with them. So I can hear you when you say that you know, they're constantly on their screens. And I keep saying this, as your children will grow, you will be less and less appealing to them. But that's because you are lit literally like a to-do list. Have you done this? Have you done this? Have you brushed your teeth? Have you done that? Like, it just goes on and on. When was the last time that you were as entertaining as Instagram? Right? Or as, uh, as uh, a, a story? Right? My point is that I am with you that yes, it's a battle that all of us are fighting. But the answer is not to say this is an evil. The answer is to say, what can I do to battle this evil in a way that's as engaging, as consuming? It's oratory, it's audiovisual, it's fun, it's music, it's not Ghana, it's drama. How are you making it fun for your child? That's such a positive approach. And two, two or three really positive things have come out of this discussion that for creators, up your game, be original, you know, uh, f uh, get an Oppenheimer together. Be original, be creative. Yeah. And, and as well as for creators, parents as well, and the two may be an intersection set, be original. So parents as well, be original. Um, any, and yes, and uh, two questions. Sorry, just to yeah. add to that, even teachers, why should only parents take the onus? There is a brilliant AR app, I'm, I'm going a 
little bit behind, which actually helps you dissect a frog on your iPad with the pencil and teaches you science in real time. When I saw that app, I was absolutely blown. I wish I was taught science like this. I would never take that two minute washroom break every time like physics or chemistry or something else was taught. Make technology work for you that would actually make it more interesting for, for children. So you use, use apps, yeah. There are two questions, one first and then, oh, you've got the mic. So first and then second, yeah. Hi, so my name is Akshay and thank you for this wonderful session over. Uh, you know, so I grew up with amazing books like Tinkle, Champak, right? Uh, Amar Chitrakatha, these are all illustrated uh, magazines and books which actually gave us so much entertainment, right, as kids. Will AI, do you think that will be able to replace these at ever? Or is there any way that uh, someone will end up finding a replacement for these? Tanuj, you take that. <laughs> One of the first uh, books produced by AI, if I remember correctly, or at least I saw it talked about a lot on Twitter, was uh, a book very similar to that intended for that audience. And I think that, so one of the first complete uh, books was made for children. It was a book with uh, images, with some text. Now, yeah, so, so it will. So says it, yes, <coughs> that's the pessimist. Meena, I mean, it, 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 it did require a human to be involved in the process of the production, right, uh, to be the prompter and so on and so forth. But both the images and the text were created by the machine. So. Honestly, I'm very excited by all the possibilities that AI is throwing up in all realms because I'm not seeing it as a threat. I'm seeing it as a substitution, as a supplement and not a substitution. A so I think uh, because it has so many limitations, it'll coexist with what we already know. But AR and VR, it's all so exciting. I'm telling you, like, I keep thinking if I can create uh, characters that, uh, that are animated or 3D images or uh, that can take my stories forward, uh, what is the harm in that? So I think everything will coexist. It'll be a part of publishing, like e-books or audio books. It'll be one part of it. But I don't think it's the death of the traditional novel. Or it's not the death of the novelist or the death of the long format either. I think everything will just coexist because people are, people are so eager to consume stories the way they've never done before. And I think the most powerful people in the world are not those who you imagine like politicians. I think the most powerful people in the world are storytellers. And we must never forget that. Great words. Huh? Yeah, yes. Yeah. I think that mm -hmm. these books might be replaced uh, not because they are defunct or any other way. They may be replaced if the value systems change. So the, the value systems with which I had read in Amar Chitrakatha, it was about good over evil. Now the protagonist is quite flawed. So if I went for Minions, Rise of the Gru, which was a fascinating film, by the way, uh, I was sh very surprised by how um, uh, flawed the hero was. If anyone's seen the film, in the end, the guy who pretty much plays a prank on everyone wins the game. And that was never a problem when we were, our uh, binaries were quite clear. It was good, evil, there was no complexity. So if you do have a change, it would be because the fundamental nature of the value system has changed is, is basically where I'm coming from. Yeah, I, yes, I love that. And that's uh, like uh, got so much of scope for so much of discussion, the, the value systems. But we are running out of time and we have one last question. Hi, so I just had a quick question. So this entire conversation today has revolved a lot around AI per se. But I'm just wondering, and I'm, I'm throwing this open to all of you, whether a technology like, say, blockchain might be a counter to AI, so for, and I'm using an example, say in the space of plagiarism. Do you think that if you embraced more than one technology or went at the intersection of the two, that you might have, that you might be able to counter the negative impacts of it? Yeah, regulation and blockchain you, you work on as well, right, Tanuj? So if you want to come in, Gayatri, on regulation. Uh, uh, regulation that includes uses technologies like blockchain, right? So, um, I mean, let's, let's, let's use an example. So when we're talking about things like plagiarism, if you've, before you've put your, your work out there, let's say you blockchain timestamped it. For, so I'm, I'm just asking, I mean, is that 
something that you see as potentially helping to counter the negative impacts, or do you think it has its own negative impacts? I, so, uh, so you saying I, I put it on the ledger and uh, it basically the authorship is is indisputable, right? That 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 would be I'm the saying that when result. You, when you create something, you're creating a piece of work, whatever, what, and in this case, literature, right? But it could be art, it could be anything, and you put it up on a distributed ledger system. So automatically, it's it's sort of time stamped and it's 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 out there, right? Um, no one's going to dispute. I mean, it, oh, it's very hard to dispute that it's your work. And then let's say AI feeds off of it, right? You actually, ha I mean, the way I see it, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you would have a counter to AI being able to plagiarize that work. No, but, but I mean, do you the, see it? The only way this, this works is, so if, if I put it on the blockchain and authors, uh, my authorship is indisputable, of course the AI can't use it. But uh, but I'm not too sure how the reader accesses it uh, itself. You know, like uh, uh, books exist in multiple medium, and there are sentences for books which are inside our heads, right? So I don't know b putting onto the blockchain an entire ninety thousand word text, for example, right? What 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 does it really do? It it really puts the stamp on your authorship. But unless you stop open AI from consuming the text, which is what uh, I think you're saying it will achieve. No, I'm not saying it's, I'm just asking. It's, I it's, it's an example. Great, uh, it's I think I understood what she's saying. Uh, there's this uh, lovely show called Guilty Minds, where uh, there's an episode of the same thing, musical piracy, where a guy creates an app which takes this, you know, Suran Tal from different songs and makes such a beautiful song that it renders all other songs obsolete. It's all through technology and AI and all of that. And um, the argument in the court is the same thing that I mentioned earlier, that a good artist copy and great artists steal. And the funny bit about this line, I'm paraphrasing it, but the funny bit is that nobody knows who the original creator of the sentence is. Some people say it's Tolstoy, some people say it's Oscar Wilde, uh, some people are like it's Pablo Picasso. So I think what you're trying to say is that how will it impact them? Digital NFTs, what you're talking about is a regulated space. Um, and a lot of people have actually said that we must, you know, as writers, that's the future for us as well, to create, uh, you know, your books as NFTs. Uh, so it's a great way forward, again, for us to embrace. Well, the but like anything else, yeah, no, I but could, the yeah. whole, there's no original story in the world today. Lovely. We are all co-creations, we are all copies of each other, and we are all copies of the stories that exist before us, and will exist after us. So nothing in this world is original. And AI is going to cash in on that sentiment far more than we know. That's a really powerful note to I end just on. Like and it's uh, like a combination lock, right? Every combination lock is a new piece of creative. Yeah. So like she said, to add to that, uh, who's the original creator is, is just hard to uh, nail down. On that note. On, on that happy note. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but dropping an energy of the book is one way of putting on the blockchain. It's guarantees you yeah, your, your, your but, uh, but I don't know how many people know how to buy NFTs in this crypto winter. Um, and, and just to his uh, point, you know, Amarchitra Katha, we've all grown up on it. But they're also innovating with time. And they are using AI and they're using technology to make their books a little more interesting and more relevant to today. They have their backlist, but also their forthcoming list are more relevant to this audience of today. But t on that note, you know, um, uh, I had read about this, uh, this do uh, docent in a, a museum in Paris. He was a robot who basically had a hat and a scarf, and I think his name was Bernison. And what the guy did was he roamed around, studied all the facial expressions of everybody visiting the museum, and developed his own intelligence and became an art critic. So I'm thinking maybe in the future, in the Asiatic society down the road, we'll have a robot who looks at people's reading habits and will become the librarian or the yeah. book critic. Who knows? That could possibly be the future. But thank you very much for a fascinating session. Uh, thank you to our excellent speakers, uh, Gayatri, Meghna, Tanuj, and Mansi, and Sonia for so skillfully and, 
and humorously moderating this engaging session. Thank you to our partners, uh, the NGMA, uh, Nazneen Ji and Shruti for hosting us, and to our audiences for always being here. Um, I know there are so many other things like your devices that you could be on, but you are here. And luckily there's no network in this room, so we couldn't tempt you. Uh, but we have many more interesting programs coming up. We have two uh, theatrical extravagances happening at the Royal Opera House next week. Uh, a Women's Day, a Women's Festival, uh, where Royal Padamsi Create Foundation has bitter chocolate and unlimited. So if you're interested, do, do stop by uh, and collect some information on that. To find out more about our programs, just stalk us on social media. That's the way to do it. Or visit our website. But thank you very much for coming and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.